written by our founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence is this indelible truth. All men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In order to secure these righteous principles for its citizens, the United States of America had fought through the Revolutionary War against the British. It wasn't until September 3rd of 1783 that our young nation had succeeded in liberating our ancestors from Britain's rule. Even with this newly achieved freedom, America still had much work to do before our glorious country was ready to flourish. Seventeen ninety two was a particularly special year as it marked a period of astounding growth for the United States. For one, America was still rapidly expanding, adding its fifteenth state, Kentucky, to the Union on June first, seventeen ninety two. This monumental year also brought on the creation of the White House, which had its cornerstone laid down in Washington, D.C. on October 13, 1792. Our unprecedented growth couldn't occur without financial stability. Thus, the Buttonwood Agreement was signed on May 17, 1792, creating the world's largest stock exchange, the New York Stock Exchange. Of all the monumental events occurring in 1792, the most significant may have been the signing of the Coinage Act of 1792. Prior to the release of official American coinage, many of the coins circulating around the United States were foreign coins, such as German dollars and Spanish eight reals, as well as a plethora of privately minted coins. The founding fathers of our newly formed nation knew that to be taken seriously in the eyes of the world, America would need to initiate a national monetary system of its own. If our country continued to rely on the coinage of other nations, would there ever be a point where we gain true independence? With this in mind, the first president of the United States, George Washington, signed the Coinage Act of 1792. This act authorized the first U.S. Mint in history, established the dollar as America's standard unit of money, and created the denominations of coinage that would be used in our illustrious country. Although the first official U.S. coins were struck in 1793, there were some pattern coins minted before choosing the ideal coin designs to represent our country. A pattern coin is a coin that has not been approved for release, but has been struck specifically for the purpose of evaluating the design. These pattern coins are struck in minuscule quantities and often have minages in single digits. Rare Collectibles TV is lucky enough to have the privilege of sharing a private collection that includes three of the earliest U.S. pattern coins struck the year prior to the official opening of the U.S. Mint. These three coins include two varieties of the 1792 Birch Cent, and the 1792 Eagle on Globe quarter dollar and are some of the most important coins in U.S. history due to their crucial role in establishing America's official coinage. As these coins were put into production by and for the founding fathers of our country, it is highly likely that these examples were held by and inspected by the likes of Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, and even George Washington himself. As the first director of the U.S. Mint, David Rittenhouse, purchased land at 7th Street and 631 Filbert Street in Philadelphia in order to construct the first Philadelphia Mint. Initially, there were many design options to be struck for the U.S. Mint one of which was Benjamin Franklin's famed Fujio scent design. This iconic design showcased a sundial on the obverse with the inscription, mind your business, and a chain link on the reverse. However, it was thought that this design could be easily counterfeited, so it was not selected. During this time, several different design ideas were proposed. 
Two of the most popular being the head of Washington and the head of Lady Liberty. George Washington himself was adamantly opposed to placing his likeness on circulating U.S. coinage as he believed this practice was indicative of the monarchy of Britain that Americans had so fervently rejected. After days of heated debate between the House and the Senate, it was decided that the design of Lady Liberty would grace our coinage instead of the head of George Washington. The result was 92 birch cent, which displays a rendition of Lady Liberty's head that bears a striking resemblance to one of the first official pieces of U.S. coinage to be struck, the 1793 flowing hair large cent. These 1792 birch cents show an inscription of liberty, parent of science and industry, surrounding Lady Liberty on the obverse, and the inscription of birch on Lady Liberty's bust line. The reverse displays the inscription, United States of America, along the rim, with a wreath surrounding the denomination one cent in the middle of the coin. With an obverse that so closely resembles the first official U.S. cent to be struck, this 1792 birch cent is undeniably one of the most important coins to ever be produced. The 1792 birch cent has less than 10 coins in existence, and that's made up of four separate varieties. The first birch cent that we have, known as Judd III, has been graded about uncirculated 58 and exhibits a plain edge design, whereas all other birch scents showcase edge lettering. As the only known example that exhibits a plain edge design, this exquisite coin is an American treasure like no other. Currently, this stunning specimen of early American coinage is valued at $2 million. The second birch cent, known as Judd IV, is graded Mint State 65 star red brown and is by far the finest known example of any birch cent in any variety. This example is one of only seven that exhibits the edge lettering that reads, to be esteemed, be useful. It is a miracle that this example has been kept in this spectacular condition over the course of more than 200 years. Exhibiting red-brown coloring and proof-like surfaces, this coin was undoubtedly set aside and placed in optimal conditions for storage almost immediately after being struck. What makes this unique coin even more special is that it is pedigreed to the distinguished David Rittenhouse. As one of the few birch scents in existence and the only example pedigreed to David Rittenhouse, this remarkable piece of coinage has been valued at four and a half million dollars. This 1792 Eagle on Globe quarter dollar is a remarkable coin as it's just one of two examples that are known to exist. Graded Specimen 63, this stunning coin has been kept in significantly better condition than its AU-50 counterpart, which is housed at the Smithsonian Institution. Joseph Wright, renowned American painter born in Bordentown, New Jersey, is responsible for this remarkable coin. The obverse of this mesmerizing coin showcases one of the most stunning renditions of Lady Liberty that has ever been struck onto a U.S. coin. Wright chose his wife, muse, and subject of many of his paintings, Sarah, as the model for this coin, as a way to immortalize her stunning beauty. In 1792, Joseph Wright was working with the United States Mint as a die sinker, and although he was never officially given the title of engraver, it's believed that he more or less fulfilled this role. This theory is held by many due to a letter addressed to George Washington from Thomas Jefferson shortly after the death of Wright. In this letter, Thomas Jefferson explains that due to the passing of Wright, the Mint will require a new nomination for engraver. 
This suggests that Wright was the original nominee for the first chief engraver position of the United States Mint before his death. Unlike many pattern coins that were created before the official release of U.S. coinage, the obverse of the eagle on globe quarter dollar is inscribed with just the word liberty. Most pattern coins of the time, however, had the much lengthier inscription of liberty, parent of science and industry. As official coinage production began at the U.S. Mint, it was decided that like the Eagle on Globe Quarter, only the word liberty would appear on the obverse. In this regard, the Eagle on Globe Quarter Dollar established the layout for generations of future American coins to come. The reverse of this quarter dollar bears an eagle that is significantly different than that of other early U.S. pattern coins. Perched atop the earth, this eagle is valiant in stature as it exudes the air of a sovereign guardian. One particularly interesting design choice of this coin is that there's no inscription of the denomination at all. This has led to speculation that the intended home of this design could have been on the reverse of the cent. However, it's generally accepted that this design was intended for the quarter. As one of the only coins to be designed by Joseph Wright, this finest known 1792 Eagle on Globe quarter dollar has a numismatic legacy like no other. As one of just two examples known, one of which is unattainable as it's part of the Smithsonian's permanent collection, this mesmerizing coin is valued at $3.8 million. With such a long and illustrious history of producing some of the finest coin designs the world has seen, the earliest origins of U.S. coinage are often overlooked. Be it the 1792 Birch Cent or the 1792 Eagle on Globe quarter dollar, the pattern coins struck before the opening of the U.S. Mint have had an undeniable impact on our country's numismatic history. In many ways, these remarkable coins provided a blueprint for the most beloved American coins to ever be struck. Whether you collect Morgan Dollars, St. Gaudens Double Eagles, Liberty Head Gold Eagles, or American Silver Eagles, these coins may not be around today if it wasn't for the exceptional pattern coins of early America. Coins, snacks, coins, snacks. You ask, what do stunning coins and delicious snacks have in common? I'm Jack McNamara, and I love stunning and rare coins. Oh, and I also love delicious and scrumptious food, too. Join me as I combine the best of numismatics and tasty treats into one show. Coin Snacks with Jack. Put down that tired bologna sandwich and spice up your lunch as I chat with some of the biggest names in numismatics and eat delicious snacks. From coin news and U.S. Mint releases to rare coins and numismatic oddities. From my all-time favorite coins to ancients and commemoratives, get your numismatic midweek pick-me-up with Coin Snacks with Jack. Plus, we'll eat snacks. Lots of them. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Coin Snacks with Jack. I'm your host, Jack McNamara, and Sofer here is running out of jokes for me and about how much weight I'm gaining because of this show, but it's all good. Um, you can catch me right here on YouTube and Facebook with a new episode every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. Uh, this week, our bit of numismatic news, we always share something that's been going on. And this week, I'd like to talk about a collection of Liberty Nickels that was sold recently. There was a full collection of Liberty Nickels contained every coin struck in the series from 1883 all the way to 1913. Yep, you heard that right, 1913. One of the elusive 1913 Liberty Head Nickels has traded hands, which is something we rarely see happen. There were only five of them struck, so it's an extremely rare coin. You know, one of the most famous coins in numismatics. To add to the excitement, 
This isn't just any example of the 1913 Liberty Nickel. This is the finest known specimen, graded proof 66 condition, and this monumental collection sold for a total of $6 million. Prior to that, the uh, proof 66 Liberty Nickel last sold at auction in 2018 for about $4.5 million. So that's the big, uh, big excitement for the week uh, in the world of coins. I just want to say thank you to everyone who gets my show on the air every week. Chris, Joey, Sofer, Colleen, Nate, Elliot, Alex, thank you guys so much. And this week, we have another lunch special for you all. We are going to be giving you 5% off all Liberty Head gold in our inventory. This is going to last until 3 o'clock Pacific time, 6 o'clock Eastern time. So do not hesitate to check out our selection. Go to Rare collectibles.tv.com and remember no code is necessary the website does it for you so look for those coins at our website but first check out our show it's time for us to introduce our special guest today we have a man that you might recognize from his last appearance on our show a couple months ago when we talked about the Larry Miller collection he's a great guy he's a close friend of the show he's a friend of mine uh, a PNG Lifetime Achievement Award winner, PNG, the Professional Numismatist Guild, numismatic icon who knows more about. <laughs> Today we have Mr. Kevin Lipton. Thanks for coming on, Kevin. Yay, I'm here. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> before we start, I'd like to compliment you on those lovely photos you have behind your desk. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk quite a bit about these today. They're beautiful, though, right? Beautiful coins. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you for allowing us to uh, photograph these coins. My pleasure, of course. So, uh, to these coins that you've just mentioned behind me, you know, we have a very interesting show today. It's a, a topic I'm fascinated with. I love this early U.S. numismatics, um, but real quick, as you know, Kevin. We need to introduce Colleen to introduce our snack. As you know, this is very important to both of us here, maybe more so than the coins. We need to find out our snack. Here. To me. <laughs> okay. Well, hello, Jack. Hello, Kevin. Kevin, hey, whenever Colleen. you join, hello. Whenever you join our show, we know that we're going to get exciting stories, and we're going to talk about really incredible, crazy coins. So first, you know, to add to the drama, I wore my big sleeves, just, you know, to set the stage. Uh, and then we went way back, like 200 years back for our dessert. And this is called the Apple Pan Dowdy. Here it is mm -hmm. right here. Yeah. And legend has it that our second president, James Adams, and his wife, Abigail, after they sat down for a dinner of, of turtle soup and, and uh, New England salmon, that they finished it off with her favorite dessert, which is the Apple Pan Dowdy. Mm -hmm. So be the beauty of this is you just take an array of apples, you season it with spices, you sweeten it. Back then it would have been molasses. I, of course, use maple syrup. And then you just put this buttery crust on the top. And then halfway in between comes the, comes the name Dowdy, which comes from the word Dowd, which means, you know, inelegant. Because you, cr you slice up the crust and you kind of make it messy, which allows the juices to kind of lap onto the crust mm. and create another another bit of yumminess. And then at the end, you just top it off with fresh whipped cream because everything is better with whipped cream. And that's it. Yeah. So I'm gonna- I've eaten half yours. mine already. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you enjoyed it. That's great. And Delicious. I'm pleased, Jack. And you can all uh, continue on with our colonial coins. All right, very exciting. We can uh, we can continue uh, numismatizing. I've got a small piece here that- uh, That's small? That Colleen gave me that's about the size of my head. <laughs> she, knows, she knows I'm a growing boy and I and I need a, you know, a decent size uh, sample here. It looks like you're enjoying yours, Kevin, though. Very good. This is, this is the only reason you agreed to come back a second time is because you know we're gonna feed you, right? I'd like to suggest, since we're going to go with the colonial and serving food, perhaps next time I'm on, we can do like a clam bake and serve lobster and clams. Yes. Oh, okay. And you know, I can wear a bib, it'd be perfect. <laughs> yeah, we can wear a bib and be dripping down our faces. Everything, it'd be real dripping. I would do that. I have no problem with that. We may have to take you up on that offer. Well, you know, what people <laughs> don't know is that 
for many years, if you were in jail in prison in New England, Maine, or anywhere near the coast, um, the the main food you would eat was lobster. Right. Because it was so readily available and it was so cheap that prisoners were eating, you know, like, you know, $300 dinners and didn't know it, you know, all the time. <laughs> so um, lobster dinner it is. I agree. That's funny. So I, I'm hoping that this. Like I'm hoping that Kevin, this isn't as as bad as jail for you to come and join us and eat with me. So, <laughs> <My pleasure. laughs> so today, you know, we're going to talk about these early pattern coins, and you know, many times people think of the first U.S. coins. You know, they think about coins. I, I think of the chain cent. You know, the first year of the U.S. mint. You know, the half cent. A lot of people think about the flowing hair dollar, you know, 1794, the chain cent and half cent were 1793. You know, these are the first official coins struck by the U.S. Mint. But there were actually these pattern coins that were struck first. Can you first kind of tell our viewers, you know, what is a pattern coin? Well, a pattern coin, very simply, is a proposed design of a future mint product that either is or is not going to be used or they could use certain elements of it in the chosen design for the coin that they end up minting. So a uh, pattern coin can mean a lot of different things. Uh, but in the case of these pattern coins, uh, they are the most important of all that exist. Right. Essentially, they're a prototype or a trial. They're trying to figure out what kind of coins they're going to make and they're kind of going through. Just like when they're doing anything else, if they're building a car or building a anything else even even when you have a great you build a great house they they make the little models of them and right. stuff like that it's all in the same genre and category so you can get a sense of what it is you're going to have when you're done right right now the coins we're going to talk about today are coins that were struck prior to the u.s mint's official opening and can you tell us a little bit about which coins we're going to be talking about here sure you're going to be talking about um the 1792 Bird Cent and the 1792 Right Quarter, uh, both of which are amongst the most important coins ever struck, uh, amongst the most valuable coins ever struck. Mm -hmm. And what's most important to me is they are the most historical coins yes. we've ever struck. And the whole history, I mean, just leads up to our first coinage and also why we, we didn't do some other things that were proposed before this. So it's, they're, they're intriguing in so many different ways. Right. And talking about the, you know, how historical they are, like you said, these are as historical as it gets in our you know, foundation of our money system and our nation. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no documentation, but it's almost, I mean, it'd be surprising if like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, like if they didn't handle these coins. I mean, they were deciding on these coins. Oh, for sure they did. I mean, because so much that led up to it, there's a lot written about it. Um, after the Constitution was passed, um, the most important thing that any new nation can do is create their own coinage. And and that is just the base of any, any government and new nation that there is. So after the, after the Revolutionary War, the big thing was George Washington is our, is our hero. We want to treat him like a king and um, exalt him in every way. And the coolest thing about it was brilliance in George Washington in knowing that he wanted a democratic republic and refused to be made king. And what's even more interesting, the original proposed designs by people that wanted to have the quote unquote contract to make the first coinage were all wanting to depict George Washington on the coins. Right. There's some fabulous coins from 1791, which I own that are considered colonial era coins because right. they weren't struck at the mint that all have depictions of George Washington on them. And he right. was like, no, that is not what we're going to do. No living man should be on as a portrait on our coinage. And it was a big stir because, of course, at first everyone wanted to honor him. And the most fabulous way to honor him was right. to put him on a coin. And he refused. So right. what happened instead was they started coming up with other depictions of what they thought our coinage should look like. Right. You know, it's, you know, Washington was such a humble guy. I mean, he kind of 
didn't even want to be president. And then it was such a big deal to him that we are not a monarchy. We are not putting our rulers on, our leaders on the coins. You know, they still Absolutely. did have a very European style. You know, you do have a, you know, a, you know, we adopted this idea of having a woman representing liberty. So you still have a profile and kind of a shield or coat of arms or some kind of thing on the reverse where it has a, a stylistic similarity yeah. but it I mean, doesn't when, when have we, the same you know uh you know ideals behind it you know when you look at a coin especially these coins and you walk through every part of them it's it's telling a story of history in just so many different ways on the coins themselves just the fact that if you look at the reverse of of the birch scent you'll see that it says one one hundred we, we, we created that first decimal system on coins. That was the one cent. Right. It says 100. And you look at, you just examine the reverse. United States of America. That's obvious. The colonies became the United States of America. Right. The colonies becoming one. The fact that it's one cent, totally new in the world of money. Um, the laurel wreath is just a fabulous design that was used throughout history so many more times in so many different ways. And if you look at the front of the coin, which is really intriguing as well, if we can do that. Yeah, no, it's coming. Uh, there it is. Okay, so to me, the, the, beauty, the greatest thing on this coin is, starts right at the top, liberty, parent of science and industry. Right. I mean, you can just, anybody can mull on those words and think about what they mean. Without liberty, you don't have science, you don't have industry. And that, that holds so true even today right. in these countries that are that don't let people express themselves and learn and, and project themselves, whether as artists, musicians, a million different ways, you you what you do is you retard growth and 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 the growth of people. It's just amazing. And this particular saying, liberty, parent of science and industry, has been attributed to the fabulous Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> That's no shocker so, since he's he kind of, you know, he's our first Renaissance man. He was, uh, he did so many things, you know, would you, he founded would you, the would post office, the fire out? department, the library, like all the first things in the United States. How about to go so back in history and get to hang out with him? I'd rather hang out with him than Washington. Oh, I yeah. think he'd well, he was, coolest, you know, he was kind of a party. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I'd go to Paris with him and hang out yeah. for a few hours. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you could wear a sure. raccoon hat and hang out with the All ladies. All of it. <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that. Um, you haven't been to my house. I have one of the greatest pieces of Benjamin Franklin memorabilia in existence that was made in France while he was there. And there was so much complaining about him frolicking about instead of working on the country's business. And... Um, <laughs> I really can't like say on air exactly what it is, but it's <laughs> pornographic for one, but it shows Benjamin Franklin naked having having fun with Miss Liberty. And it's just it's just incredible. And it's of the era. It was made in France at the time. And, and when I bought it about 20 years ago, the first call I got was from the Benjamin Franklin Museum, who desperately wanted it alone. I mean, it's just incredible. <laughs> anyway, I didn't mean to segue off, but I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing. Well, we're talking to... about our founding fathers, so, oh. you know. <laughs> but the thing that's cool is that this is of the period. Right, it's not like something somebody done, made later, right. And it was done in France. So it's a pretty good indication that the stories you hear about old Ben were likely pretty right on about how he, <laughs> how he behaved and his character. Right. But... Um, well, let's get back to the ideas of liberty. Sorry. and <laughs> By the way, he was expressing his liberty over there. Yeah. <laughs> that would be clear about. Um, oh, boy. Okay, now, I, now <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to get back on track here. <laughs> so we got the bird set. No, it's all good. But you're right. Like the coins, they have these ideas of the founding fathers, those ideas of liberty. You know, like you said, first off, once we finally establish our freedom, you know, because – you know, we always think of you know July fourth, seventeen seventy six. That's just when we said, "Hey, we're our own country." It took us a while to actually, you know, get there. We had, you know, we had to fight a war yes. then. You know, we had to fight a war because England said, "No, you're not," and we said, "Yes, we are." And you know, so we had to fight England. You know, we have the Revolutionary War, 
and then we establish a government. First, there's the Confederation period. You know, you have these, you know, kind of before George Washington becomes president. So all these kind of things are beginning to evolve. You know, the, we're using coins from all over the world. We're using coins that are locally struck, you know, of coins from different colonies, you know, New Jersey striking coins, Massachusetts, Connecticut striking their own coins. A lot of, like you said, George Washington imagery then where private people are striking coins. Exactly. Because you, you have to remember, you know, it was different than today. People are using coins interchangeably. I mean, the idea of a coin is just X amount of metal. So a, a piece of copper this big is worth the same, whether it has New Jersey or, or it's a British coin or, right. or whatever's on it. So they're so using them right. interchangeably. But our, our, four, our founding father said, we've got to, you know, to show the world we're a country and for them to take us serious, we have to have our own money. Right. So um, Washington told Mr. Jefferson that to get going on this, and um, he put him in charge of, of establishing a mint, um, finding uh, the coin designs, approving them, and the series of 1792 coinage was 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 evolving and were struck. Um, the first ones made were the half dismas, right. which they there's rumors they were made. Uh, and as a portrait of Martha, et cetera, et cetera. And they made quite a few of them. They made 1,500 of them and right. started passing them around. Wait, those ones actually had, circulated a bit. Correct, they did. And then then they came forth and they said, okay, we got to make this official. So we want to get some designs. We want to get higher people to do these things. And Jefferson was in charge. So um, actually the, the man that he hired was a guy named Rittenhouse, who actually purchased the property in Philadelphia where the yield mint was established? Uh -huh. uh, you had to go out and buy the buy the minting equipment. He had to, um, you know, procure the metals needed to strike these things. So these first coins made at the mint were likely number one was the bird cent, mm -hmm. um, the right quarter, and then a series of other patterns were made as well. Uh, copper Disney, which was like a dime. Um, the, the, um, there were several other coins as well. But the funniest thing about it is, and the reason why you'll see why I own these two coins, other than the birch scent in the right quarter, these other depictions of liberty look like witches, literally. <laughs> and um, while I've owned, I've owned several of them, uh, I own the finest known silver center scent, um, a coin that recently sold from us three million dollars at auction but if you look at it it, it could frighten a house right. i mean these women were not good looking ladies so <laughs> when you have the bird scent who who starting with that coin first she's a very attractive woman of that era mm -hmm. um the model from it there's been rumors that it was martha washington but when you look at this this is a very handsome woman of the era her hair is back in in a very typical style. She has a beautiful expression on her face mm -hmm. and um, just magnificent. And these coins, these these birch scents, and that's another story too. Birch, they've always called birch scents, but no one knows for sure that Mr. Birch actually was the man behind the coins. There's assumptions. He well, was it does say birch right on her neck. I see it right on the truncation of her neck there. It says birch. Correct. However, they don't know they don't know which which one it was. Oh, which you know, birch? Those are initials. They assume it. That's not the name. Those are the initials. Um, and it's also, when he, it says birch right in there. I don't think so, my brother. I, I got it pretty big. Maybe I'm incorrect, and I'm a poor historian this morning. But we don't know which birch it is. Well, there was him and, and his son were both artists. Okay. Um, there's a lot more clarity on the fact that the a Wright quarter was done by Wright, Joseph Wright, because right. it's it's an absolute depiction of his wife. Right. And if you right. look at if you look at paintings of the era, uh, mm -hmm. you'll see the same exact face on on paintings done by Wright that were of his wife. So he was going to be, and and as you can see. This is just a stunning portrait. This is a beautiful, classic woman face any time in history. 
she was a absolute beauty of the era. Unfortunately, Joseph Wright died of yellow fever in 1793, or likely our early renditions of a lot of coins would have been much more attractive right. rather than the chain penny who took on the, the look of that uh, right. scary right. woman as well. Even right. It's a fat right. I, right. I love the chain scent, but you know, they, they called it like the frightened Liberty or the witch or like, you know, she had oh, yeah. that straggly hair and kind of like that. Oh like, yeah. She Not looked a like the look. wizard of Oz, the witch from the wizard of yeah. Oz. They, they improved it with the wreath scent <laughs> right. and it got better. But only slightly. But, <laughs> but if Joseph Wright had lived, rest assured our earliest designs would have been much more attractive uh, right. women picked it as liberty right because you have to keep in mind and I, i've you know told people like a lot of our early coins and you know by the time we're establishing the mint it's getting a little better but like the prior the colonial privately struck things it's they're not looking for artists they're they're grabbing like a blacksmith or some like anybody who can work with metal and like, Hey, can you make a coin? And they, sure. <laughs> like the art was kind of secondary. Now that we're establishing our nation in a mint, they're actually trying to get artists here to, to, Oh make yeah. I mean, when, that, you, when you look at some colonial, colonial era coins, like, uh, uh, like I love the, Pegasus, yeah, baby head Connecticut with that big round oh, head. Like, oh, they're, they, they're as crude as can be. Yeah. I mean, just incredibly crudely done. Um, and this was our first shot at making beautiful money. Right. Which to impress was, you know, the world. You know, impress show the us, world show them that we've we arrived. Right. Now, these are okay. a these were struck by the mint, uh, but, but there was no actual mint yet. So these weren't struck in that building because they were still, it wasn't constructed. They were still building out the right. mint. Right. But, but these are officially the struck under the authority of the mint. Of the first U.S. mint, exactly. Right. They were. They were probably done in a, a barn next door or something, you know, but, but right. the, rest assured, these coins were presented to Thomas Jefferson mm -hmm. to get his input and his approval. And rest assured that Thomas Jefferson showed them to George Washington. Right. I mean, you could, if you did a DNA test on these coins <laughs> and you had the ability to, I don't know if we can today, or what, you would see the DNA of our founding fathers. Well, I'd be oh, worried after you told me about your Franklin thing about the, <laughs> what we might find. <laughs> but um, yeah, I would imagine Hamilton would have been involved. Like all these guys were were involved in you know, deciding so on these important. coins. So right. important for, for a foundling new nation. It, 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 was, it was meant everything to establish a mint, to create our own money, and to do that complete break away from England and stop using coins from Mexico and all over the world. It's like, okay, we are a nation. We are going to have our own money and we're going to do it. That's why a lot of these early coins uh, in 1793, when we officially started making coins, half cents and pennies, they made a lot of them. Mm -hmm. They made a lot of 1793 half cents and, and large cents. And that's why they're so common to find in very, very circulated condition. Yeah. Because they were heavily circulated. Right. Well, and a lot is relative. A lot was, you know, relative to the day. Now it would, it's tiny comparatively to what they make today. Oh, but yeah, course. but at the time it was, yeah, they're making them in the thousands. But you're right. I mean, when I was a kid, I was ex thrilled to see, like, in my grandfather's collection, he had a, a 1793 half cent. It was like bent. You know, like, yes. you know, and that's kind of what you, you know, what you find. It's corroded. Copper was such a corrosive metal, like a reactive metal. They're all corroded and. Most of them are not very pretty. Looking. Oh my goodness! No, any any early large scent that's in a beautiful state of preservation is highly sought um, by collectors and and historians alike. I mean, yeah. because especially so many of them, if they were preserved properly, take on this elegant, beautiful look of uh, like a fine piece of furniture that's yeah. never been messed with, or yeah. just having a, an incredible original patina like these two coins yeah. have. I mean, that, that's another thing that drew me to them is the fact that they were both so original and so perfect for, for what they were. Um, yeah. It's just incredible. I mean, we, we talk about a lot, you know, we coins that should not exist. This is the epitome of, like, how does something – because even though these were struck as patterns and they would have been given to these VIP, you know, Rittenhouse and things like this, you know, these are coins that at that time period – there wasn't a lot of money in the in the early country. They used everything. Even things that were made oh. specially ended up getting used anyway. 
Well, that's why so many of the uh, original bird scents are worn because they were used. But this particular one, when it was struck, and likely it was the first one, was presented to to uh, Jefferson to see what we had done. But then it was given to David Rittenhouse as a souvenir. So it likely was the very, very first one struck. And clearly, in the state of preservation, it was taken care of from the moment it came off the press right. in 1792 as the treasure that it is today. Otherwise, it would have scratches, it would have marks. This coin is an incredible state of preservation for, for a coin like this from so long ago. And I find incredible. it unbelievable too that you know this coin still has some of the mint red color on it, which even a coin that from that era, if you do everything right to take care of it and preserve it and there's oh, yeah. no marks, they still usually have no mint red just because of the what's in the air, you know, the oh. humidity and things. The other thing that's so amazing about this coin is the pedigree. Now let me look and look at my cheap tubes here because I don't want to get it wrong. James L. Elworth got it in the early part of the 20th century. Then it went to John Ward Garrett, who was, had one of the greatest coin collections of all time. Right, 1980, huge then, auction, four catalogs. Huge yeah. auction, which I was there. And um, it, was, it was given to John Hopkins University and they sold the collection uh, back in 70, I think it was I, I thought it was 80, here. but it might have been 79 and 80, like it might have 81, 81, excuse me. And Donald Partridge was the purchaser of it at the sale then. So this coin's only had, prior to me having it, five, five, five people that have passed it along since it was struck in 1792. So it's it's pretty cool. And I love and, that uh, part of it, the history too. Of like, you know, you don't hear people talk about it as much today. You hear once in a while like Elias Berg come up, but I always loved as I was getting into collecting, like looking at those famous collections, you know, Garrett and Virgil Brand and you know Norweb and and these people, these collectors who were kind of the the forefathers of collecting and the visionaries who were you know putting together these collections and and you know a coin like this is exactly that like all these people you know even Partrick even though he only passed away within the last couple of years he's kind of of our time you know he's a contemporary of ours even though he was older than us unbelievable what he put away absolutely spectacular yeah i mean from oh. the 50s or 60s he started and i guess he he you know he was when i was at stacks he used to be at the auctions all the time you know cool dude isn't he Remember yeah i met him thing? once i met him once when he was the uh you know, the ANS gala every year, he was like the you know man of the year or whatever they do. Yeah. You know, the other thing too, that one must remember and um, living here in Beverly Hills, you get a better sense of it. Just because people have wealth doesn't mean they have taste. <laughs> and, and people collect things that, yeah. that are not great, that are not fabulous. Very wealthy people that have unlimited pocketbooks sometimes put together collections of stuff and you're like underwhelmed. Yeah, okay. not part So, I mean, no, no, not at all. He always bought fabulous condition and the best of the best. Yep. So, you know, my hat's off to Donald Partridge all the way. Yeah. And um, and I've seen it. I've seen it with people all through my life in, in, in coins that not the richest guys with the most money to throw around end up with the best coins because right. they, they didn't have the taste or maybe they were in a hurry to fill every hole or, or whatever it is or didn't care enough. Right. to seek out the finest. Um, you know, where it's really interesting, um, to segue away, there's a very famous guy that lived in L.A. named Armin Hammer, who was okay. the same Armin Hammer baking soda, okay. who passed away probably, I guess it was probably over 20 years now. So in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, he was an incredible collector of Impressionist art and, and modern art, mm -hmm. and the guy was cheap. So he, instead of getting the very, very best painting that was maybe, instead of being 400,000, was 700,000, he would opt for a $400,000 painting. Uh -huh. And so, lo and behold, the value of his collection, while still extremely great, would be worth billions of dollars more. That's right, with a B, billions. <laughs> if he had just bought the very best, because quite honestly, the competition wasn't there for him. And he had the money. The guy was really super rich, could have bought anything. So you see it today. There's some collectors of coins. Uh, the one person, God rest his soul, was Brent Pogue. 
Uh, more fabulous coins always yeah. had to have the best of the best yep so that, that and there's that's always important. somebody who wants the best of the best there's always somebody who wants the best of the best listen listen i i stopped being a coin collector oh god almost 50 years ago now and there's only two coins that i put in my collection and they're on the wall behind you okay and i <laughs> i i could have i could have i've had multiple 1804 dollars i love them they're cool I've owned virtually, I've had that, the 13 nickel you showed, I owned uh, 1894 S dimes in multiples, I've owned, but these are the only two coins I ever bought that I said, you know what, I'm keeping those babies, uh -huh. along with the other, right, uh, the other, the other bird the scent, other bird well, scent right, the which is unique, the unique one, which right. is unique, right. yeah, so, and, and it's not like I'm even a, a colonial freak or colonial collectors, there's, I have, I have a dear friend, Tony Terranova, sure, who I know is Tony. much more, of course, you know, Tony, um, considered expert right. in colonial era coins. But when it came to me, these two coins just, which we haven't really spoke much about the right quarter yet, were the greatest and most impressive coins that I ever had the opportunity to, to own. And I kept them. Right. You know, before we move on to the right quarter, the one thing I was going to add to, you know, that concept of, you know, buying the best of the best um, the one I always think about is is uh, John J. Pittman. I always tell that story to people here. You know, this guy was a school teacher. He was, you know, at the Farouk sale. People thought he was an idiot. He was spending, you're this, you're spending way more money than this stuff's worth. You're you're nuts. And then years later, he was a genius because he was, you know, paying, you know, kind of above the market what people thought these things were, but they were the best of the best of the best. And it turned out. You know, history shows us that again. If you, you know, you pay a little too much for the best. I do it with stuff I like, and sure. you know, in, in, in the future, it's it ends up being worthwhile. You know, you know. By the way, not you know, to say anything poor about the the dead, John J. Pittman's coin collection was first and foremost in his life, beyond and before anything. Huh. I when 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 they had their auction, uh, he lived in Rochester, New York with his family in a house that uh, to describe as humble would be <laughs> putting it nicely because everything in his life was geared to that very eccentric to uh. that point. Whereas <laughs> his family did without simple things, but he still had his tens of millions of dollars worth of coins. <laughs> So I'm, not little, I'm not little recommending. I'm not recommending that extreme. Yeah, I'm not recommending I'm that extreme. That to, 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 you know, to, but the problem with me, I've been around so long is is I kind of like know too much. You know, I've seen them. I've seen them all with their clothes off, so to speak, <laughs> including Ben Franklin. <laughs> every day at my house, I see. I see a naked Ben Franklin every day. So you, you did give us a little bit of kind of the, the pedigree history of, of the uh, Birch scent, you know, going back to Rittenhouse, you're only the fifth owner. You know, for these coins, you know, when was it that you managed to acquire them? And, and, and prior to you getting, you know, when was the last time they sold? Like, what's a little of the history of these? Okay, examples? so in the, case, in the case of the Birch scent, um, I was at the auction when, um, when uh, it was purchased by... Um, um, Oh my God, I'm losing my mind. By Donald Patrick. I bought coins at that auction. I At that Garrett sale, I was a buyer at that sale. I bought the 70 CC20, oh, wow. um, several other coins. I, I think I probably spent 100000 at that auction. Right. Um, and I think, and I really, I'd like to get the date straight. I don't remember it and I feel a little off by not I remembering thought it. Was eight, I thought it was 1980. I thought it was 1980. It's right around there. Um, okay, we're close for sure. Give we're, or take a year or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so and that's um, a ton of money back then, hundred grand. It was, yeah, it was a lot of money, but I mean, I, I had, you know, I had done very well. I was uh, around twenty years old, and uh, but I wasn't in a position to buy and keep a, a trophy like that. I was at the Garrett sale for business to buy things to make money and and flop them and sell them. Uh -huh. So I wasn't there as a collector at all. Um, so, um, when both these coins came up at a heritage sale at the Partridge, Partridge Estate right. sale, excuse me, these were before he passed away. He was very ill. He has since passed away. Um, I bought both those coins. I, I, you know, I could afford it. Um, 
I've always loved them and respected them and admired them. And, you know, it ended up blowing up. Uh, there was a ton of publicity in all the news, newspapers uh, locally and throughout the country about, you know, buying 26 cents for, I don't know, whatever it was, almost $5 million for the right. two of them. So it, it garnered a lot of publicity, which I wasn't really after at all, but sometimes it happens. And uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff about when I bought them. Um, most important thing is I made sure to do every interview with Lucy in my lap. So that was awesome. <laughs> and and uh, for those new watching, Lucy is Kevin's dog, which, who I don't see today. Where is Lucy today? She's not here today. She's really not feeling well, to be honest with you. Um, oh. She'll be dropped off a little bit later. Yeah, she's uh, she's having a tough time. She's getting up in years, and uh, she's moving a little slower, but she's still everything in the world to, to uh, me and Dale and our family. Give her, give, those, her a, give her a little pat on the head for me. Just one of those perfect dogs, you know, when the kind of dog you say. The story I like to tell about Lucy is, is this, if I may. Segue again. <laughs> uh, about 10 years ago, we had a home invasion. I wasn't home. And the, and the guy there was holding my, my two kids and Lucy and called up and they said I had to bring home 100000 in cash to, to free them. So I rushed home with the money. I told, I told the guys, I said, all right, send out the dog as a sign of good faith. Lucy came out. Lucy came in the car and I left. That's the story. <laughs> so that's how I feel about the dog. I keep the kids. I'm taking Lucy. So that's, kind of, oh, that's so funny. You know, that's so that these, story. About so this. both of these coins came from that first Partrick sale. Both of these coins were his. And he he bought. Were the, did these both come out of the Garrett sale? Then did he buy them both at Garrett? No, no. The um, the right quarter um, has appeared less than like any other coin. It was only at auction once in the in the two hundred years since it was had. I remember seeing it with Abe Kossoff in an ad as a kid at some astronomical number back then. Let me let me want to make sure I get my facts right. I mean, this is one of those coins. I, you know, when I, when I get to hold these coins, when you know, which was, you know, I really appreciate you letting me, you know, handle these and and it, um, study them. But you know, these are those coins. They just remind me when I was a kid looking in the front of the red book with my grandfather. And these are coins I never thought I would see in person because you see, it just says too known. Like, you know, like. <laughs> well, the other one, the other one is AU, and it's in the Smithsonian. Right. This coin, it far, it's not like, well, this one's this, this one's that. This one blows it away. Right. There's also a few of them that were struck in white metal. Right. And white metal right. is, is actually very crude. It's essentially tin, very, basically. Yeah, and they, it bends very easily. And um, people didn't even know that, but there were, I think, four of them in white metal. And the New York Historical Society had two on display for years. And they're actually, because of the pandemic, and needing money are selling one of their examples at auction. I mean, right. it's 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 not very attractive, not to put it down, but I mean, it's it's yeah, it's nice, but it's not the same as it has the a lot of copper. marks and it looks kind of bent. It's it's not beautiful at all. It's not like it's not anything like this coin. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, this coin to me is just the reason I love this coin so much and why I bought it then is being an art lover like I am because I'm not a coin collector anymore. I'm a very serious art collector, so I appreciate things of beauty. And to me, this was far and away the most beautiful depiction of liberty. That it's a there much was. different. It's, it's a much different look to the other liberty it's a heads. Whole you know. different look. This yeah. is a this is an homage by a man to his wife. To me, this is a, a portrait of a woman that he adores. And 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 again, if you look at the reverse of the coin, the eagle is a very strong and powerful eagle, unlike many of the early eagles on United States coins. Yeah, they look like a little scrawny chicken. Scrawny thing. Yeah. And <laughs> here, the eagle is affixed on top of the globe, meaning she's on top of the world, strong and powerful, much like the depiction they're thinking of the United States. So this coin, to me, has it all as well. It's a, it's a different kind of coin than the, and then the bird scent. But for me personally, it's kind of like more of a, a personal favorite because of the way it looks. And it's like, to me, she's so beautiful. A little mushy, it may sound, but um, I just, I just, 
I love this coin, I love the other coin. And I'll tell you, out of all three of the coins, the rarest one is the Plain Edge Birch Scent. You know, it's the only one, it's unique. And uh, you haven't, I don't think you even have a picture of that one up. Let's see if um, we can pull it up on the screen though. We have, we have it here. Um, and that one's the rarest. Right, because it's the even, only one. It's the same it's the obverse and reverse one. dies, right? But it's the only one with a plain edge. Plain edge, exactly. And the other thing, too, is is that it's still a gorgeous coin. Oh, yeah. But it's unique. And yet, even though it's unique, it's the least valuable of the three coins. Right. Which tells you why people esteem to own great things. Right. Um, and, and least value is valuable is still it's still a seven, seven figure. figure coin. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm not, right. I don't mean to downplay my own coin. No, yes. no. <laughs> it's still a seven figure coin. Um, but and she's great, a great looking coin. And uh, I, I'm so prideful to own all three of the coins. It's just uh, it's it's something I never could have imagined growing up in Teaneck, New Jersey. You know, the, the son of a, a kosher butcher, you know, it just uh it never would have been played in the cards for me. And I'm so blessed to have the ability to, to possess these kind of things. It's really, it makes you feel humble and very proud. It really does. So I was, the next question I had here, and I think you just gave us is, how does it feel to own such stunning US oh, rarities? Sorry. But that's the, it's no, it's fine. Well, this, I mean, that's, we're just conversing here and you're, you're answering all yeah. the questions because it's, 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 <laughs> They're such great the coins. Truth of the matter about owning things like this is, is the pride and ownership of having something that's special. And I and I'll tell you, I only bring them out at the A and A conventions. And last year they didn't get to come out because of COVID. Um, you know, people always, whenever I go to a coin show, they go, Oh, why don't you bring them out? Why don't you da da da? And the fact is, I think they're so special. I, you know, give people a treat, you know, once a year at A and A. I I hire uh, you know, an armed guard just to be there with the three coins and babysit them and put on a special display and and people just love them. I mean, they come just to look at the coins and and talk about them. Um, I even had um, I had special tokens made of the coins as business cards, oh, which yeah, are yeah. kind of cool. But I, I I know I still have a bunch more of them. Uh, but they're they show the depiction of both of those coins and they're like they're modern day. Uh, uh, store card or some war tokens and people just uh, you know when I put them out you know I see some people come by and instead of taking one I see people just grab them <laughs> and I never say anything because I'm I'm kind of amused at it uh -huh. but I'm I really would guess one day you know 50 years from now when I'm long gone that you'll see the tokens sell for hundreds of dollars <laughs> you know on the market for what they are yeah I, mean, I know I've really, a couple I'm certain of it um, but, um, you know, um, it's the greatest thing is, 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 is if you have something really great is to share it with people. You know, I've always, Dale and I have always opened our home to people. When the kids were little, we'd always have huge parties and, and tons of kids there. Never anything. We're not, we were never fancy, elegant people. I mean, I got the most beautiful set of silver as a wedding gift for my friends, and we've never used them. They're sitting in the safe here all black. And I'm telling you, it's the most beautiful set of silver you ever saw. We're more of the uh, hot dog, hamburgers in the backyard kind of people, and um, and it's it's always good to share. If you have if you have something worthwhile, you share it, and no matter what it is, if you have a good joke, you have knowledge, you have something beautiful, people want to know about it and people want to see it. So I'm always happy to share. Right, and these coins, really, I mean, any any coins, I mean. You know, we can't take any of this stuff with us. We're just caretakers for it. So, you know, our job is kind of to take care of I them. And I you know, couldn't share agree them. with you more. Um, I get into arguments with my wife about that all the time because I love selling my art. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I there's nothing, you know, there's a few things if I, I mean, she'd kill me if I'd sell. But for most part, I love because it, it like proves that you can go into another genre and be successful buying, you know, Tiffany lamps. I right? I have 25 major Tiffany lamps. And quite honestly, all but one, all, excuse me, two of them are not for sale. One is this fabulous wisteria that my wife loves, and she would kill me if I sold. And the other is a window that's just incredible that was in, actually was in the National Gallery in Washington, as well as the National Museum in Japan for many years on display. It's just, 
just spectacular. But other than that, all the other hundreds of objects I have, come shop with me. Right. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, I know you pretty well now. I've known you almost 20 years. And, you know, I know you appreciate these beautiful things. You appreciate the history. You appreciate the art. But you're a guy who just loves to wheel and deal. Like, that's your joy is, is that, finding the great deal and then, you know, kind of being in the middle of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, I mean, you look around, you have a couple coin boxes of coins behind you, it looks like. Just a couple. Hundreds, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even realize. Yeah, I'm in I'm in Lou's room because I can lock this room out and it, it and it's quiet. Um, but this is in our main our main trading room, main trading rooms in, at the other side. This actually before we grew was our main trading room, and uh, there was four of us. I used to work in this small office together. Uh -huh. So. Um, now well, it's, I, I uh, remember it for a while when that was your library. You had all your art books on that wall there. Well, we did, and and um, unfortunately, because we've run out of space, I've had to pack my library up and put it in storage. So uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get back to these these stunning uh, rarities yeah. here for a second, because we're. Oh, I, I don't mean to got, got, you, No, it's fine. I love chatting, and I think I think it's interesting <laughs> for our viewers here too. But I know you have about. 10 minutes uh, only left to share with us. So, um, you know, people tuned in for these coins. Um, you know, obviously there's some similarities to U.S. coins. You know, we've got the the birch scent kind of, it does look a little like a chain scent, or not quite. It's more, I'm trying to think. But, but, it, it's, but, it's clearly the basis of where they started right. to get where they wanted to. Remember, um, First of all, the, the the lady's face is very pleasant. The chain sense face, the lady is angry. But more so, is the reverse of this coin is very similar to a, a wreath sound the second yeah. time. Yeah, very similar. Um, they they lost the beauty in their depiction on the on the on the first large sense we made. Whoever did it probably had a bad night the night before. Yeah, who was the first one? Was that Eckfield? Who was the the? Uh -huh. So he was Adam Eckfield, I believe. So it yes. would have been. So it essentially probably would have been right doing this artwork if he didn't no, pass from yellow fever. No doubt. So they kind of had to go to their their bench, and they didn't have that strong of a bench, I guess. No, um, yeah, definitely not. And and you know, remember, Wright was a classically trained artist. I mean, yeah, he's a painter, artist, right? Yes, he has stuff. And and Washington loved him because he did some portraits of Washington that George Washington loved. Actually, and it's no, I'm not making this up. He thought Wright was a better painter than Peel. Oh, the really? Was only, yes, he loved Wright's work. So, so did yeah, Wright do any paintings of Washington, or did he? Basically, oh, yes, yeah. He, yeah. There's absolutely paintings of him. Huh? Yes, because because the Peel one, though, as you said, that's the famous. Well, he's the one that's yes. He was the most famous portrait artist for out of the period, but but Washington liked Wright's work better. So there. <laughs> so Wright, so did Wright do any other metal work before that? Like, do you know, did he do any metals or private tokens well, he, or anything? Do you he, know? Of? He did mostly. He did some enamels, but but he was mostly a portrait artist. Whereas um, he, he was he was a a classic portrait artist. He was back in London. There's a lot of discrepancy about the dates because he left and went back to London, and he was there during the war. So um, he was uh, he was very familiar with the term Yankee Doodle, which is which is uh, referred to in London. Was the term Yankee Doodle wasn't American? It was an English slogan, and it made him and it meant American Satan. So <laughs> the, uh, the, the 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 Americans adopted it, and they made their song Yankee Doodle out of out of being called you know Satan's. So that's, oh, that's kind funny. of a cool story. Too. Yeah. I did not know that. Oh, that's a new one for me. Yep. So, so these coins, so there's, you know, the three coins. You got a the birch scent, which is the the finest grade. There's only what less than ten known, probably, of all the different varieties and like six there, of this one. There's six of this one. There's the, one the unique one is seven, and there's four of of the other um, variety, the Jed Four, and then there's the unique one that they put George Washington's signatures on. So there's 12 of all types, but um, this one is unique in front of me, and the the MS-65 is far and away 
the finest of any in existence. The other interesting thing to go back, not to be all over the place, is Jefferson himself referred to Wright as our first chief engraver. Those, okay. are, those were Jefferson's own words. And unfortunately, like we said, he died before he could actually be that chief engraver officially for, for the mint. Right. And then that, and then that, ex I'm going back and forth now. And the birch belonged to Rittenhouse. So Rittenhouse, so Rittenhouse was the director of the mint and Wright would have been the Correct. chief engraver. So essentially Correct. Rittenhouse was Moy and, 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 uh, and Wright was Mercanti. You got it. <laughs> Boom. Couldn't put it better. That's exactly right. Two, oh, two great men of the 21st century, I might add. And these coins, I understand, you're not uh, you're not actively uh, trying to to sell them. You you love owning them, but we do. I understand have kind of exclusive option if yes, somebody comes I, I to gave, us. I gave Greg Thomas, uh, who's my the partner, boss, the bosses, your partner. Uh, Besides the, Rick, obviously Rick is my partner. Yes, excuse me. Um, um, yes, an exclusive right. If he really had someone for the coins, I wasn't like eager to sell them. But if he had someone that really appreciated one of them and wanted to have one of them, that you know, perhaps we can have a chat about it. Because, like, like you said, this, there's there's the two uh, there's the lamp and the window that Dale won't let you sell, and these these are not in the um, these are not those two items. I'm just not that guy, you know. I I, I really believe that you know all you do in the end is die, and all this stuff is is there. You know, the fun is owning them and having them. And for me, is buying them and selling them. You know that that's always the thrill I always got in my life was was the commerce behind it. As a dear friend of mine once said, he said, "Kevin, you will always be merchant class because that's what I like to be as a merchant. I like to buy things and sell things." So, if somebody is interested in these, they are, as we've said, even the the most common, least expensive of, or not most common, <laughs> but the least expensive of these coins is seven figures. They should call our private advisory coin team and uh, uh, if, yeah, because if they want I, to inquire. Uh, yes, yes. Please don't call me. I'm not <laughs> home. <laughs> oh man, it's fascinating. Now, you yeah, speaking of the value of these, they're all clearly seven-figure coins, and and people who watched earlier in our documentary, we kind of talked about the the value of of, of some of these coins. Oh, is Lucy here now? Hey, Lucy. Come here, Lucy. Hey, Lucy. Come you on. want to talk about coins with us? <laughs> there she is. Lucy, hey, Lucy. Lucy Hi, Lucy. Say hello, Lucy. Yes, she is. Hey, Lucy. So before we before we wrap here, uh, you know, clearly, as we said, even the even the least expensive of these is is you know well into seven figures. These are extremely important coins, extremely rare coins. Extremely beautiful coins, extremely high quality, extreme everything you could have in a coin, basically. Um, and they're valued in the millions of dollars, and they should be. They're national treasures. Um, you know, my question I wanted to ask you is more just, can you give us a broad look at, at the coin market today? This has been a very, very, you know, this is, I mean, coins are just more popular now than they've ever been in, since I've been in the business. I know you've been oh. doing it a little longer than me. It's a very popular issue. time it's for beyond, coins. It's beyond the coin market. Uh, collectibles everywhere right. Right. are in incredible demand. Well, yeah, I just uh, saw Tom Brady rookie broke the record this week, I think, for a... Uh, for for a uh, football card and you know the highest sports cards now you see millions of dollars. A common a common card, Michael Jordan rookie card in perfect ten, which there are literally three hundred of, are selling for over a half a million dollars. Yeah. So it's it's crazy. And to me, coins while their market is fabulous and the prices for 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 great rarities are 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 doing wonderful. I think comparatively. Are our bargains still? I mean, we yeah. just saw at auction a uh, a beautiful, but not not the best Winston Churchill painting sell for eleven and a half million dollars. Uh -huh. um, it had the great pedigree that it was owned by Angeline Jolie, so that should add a few million to it. But um, <laughs> you know, I have a fabulous uh, Churchill myself. Um, right? Yeah. So see, with the ele the circus elephants. Circus elephants, fabulous painting. But I mean. We're seeing record after record uh, for coins, 
the recent auctions have, have been phenomenal. And quite honestly, um, unless you don't think there's going to be any inflation coming up, which to me would be, let me sell you a bridge. Um, <laughs> collectibles and gold uh, are going to be very positive winners over the next several years. Um, there's just there's just no doubt about it. People want to buy really, really good products, um, whether it's a piece of real estate, whether it's a great piece of art or a great coin. And right. never before right. ever have I seen anywhere close to this kind of demand. And uh, I'm just happy to be doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's across the board in collectibles. And you're, you're um, right. Like now they think about it, the newer areas, you know, it's it's a more it's a more mature market. So you've got, you know, the, the idea of certifying sports cards is, is kind of 30 years behind the coin market. And you see that this massive explosion and, and as you see in other categories, like you said, art and real estate, you know, Comic, it's uh, explosive. You're right. Everything. Yeah. Pokemon cards, you know, everything. Um, but you're right. Yeah, when you look at it, game, a super Mario video game sold for $600,000. Right. Prototype auction. Yeah. yeah but so, like you said, when you look at these things, it makes coins seem like a bargain. It seems like even uh, even even if they're more than they were, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, it doesn't matter. It's still just seems oh, there's so, no doubt. Yeah. on a relative basis. Uh, I am very bullish on coins. And quite honestly, I've never had nearly as large an inventory as I have today, which proves how bullish I am on coins. I mean, I mean, we have almost a thirty million dollar inventory of coins. Wow! Um, and that's that's only because I believe in the product so much. Right. So right. Uh, I love it. I love I love the great rarities. I love these modern coins that are so popular. I mean, we just saw a release of proof gold and proof silver for the end of the Mercanti era, where the coins all sold out by the mint in seconds, literally. Right. And with the new designs coming up in summer. Uh, with the Emily D Damster designs, right. we're going to have a second huge bull market on these coins as well. And the thing I love about it, the most important thing I love about this market, and it's what I love so much about about RCTV, is because they cater to collectors. Mm -hmm. Collectors, not people that are coming there. They're being told to, you know, you must buy gold or silver for your IRA to protect you. You're selling it to people that love what they're buying. Right. love what they're doing and the way you present it to people like i told greg the first day i met him is unique and so special and he had no idea at the time how how strongly an advocate i was of the way you guys do it and i love it big fan yeah because yeah, you know you you talk about greg a lot of people don't know who's our third partner but you know rick and i are true collectors i mean you know that you know us you know that Absolutely. we love this stuff like this is not like i fell into this because you know you know i you know somebody offered Can me a job mad, Jackson? yeah it's something i i've always done and it's something i love and i have that collector mentality like, like you know i have that mentality you know as if you're a collector you're a collector you know like i think Pretty much everybody I know collects coins, collects other stuff too. Like I like football right. cards. I collect records. They're not worth any money, but I listen to them. I, you know, sure. I I do it because I just love collecting and researching and organizing and looking at the stuff. And you know, it's just it's funny you say that. I play this little game when I meet like new people, men, not with women, and and they so often someone will say, so I say to them, what do you collect? And they go, oh, I don't collect anything. Oh, and then you start questioning them. And they all do. They all collect something. They don't they know say, it, well, but they have four watches. Right. Right. Or or they have all the keys from every hotel they went to. Right. Or, or a million different things. Right. Or now sneakerheads. I mean, I now have probably eight or ten pairs of sneakers. When I was a kid, I had one pair. I'd wear it for a year until they fell apart. Now I have like ten pairs of sneakers because, oh, huge market, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, huge sneakers. Market. I mean, there's sneakers that have sold for six figures. <laughs> Absolutely. You, you know. Yeah. It's fascinating. I agree, brother. But I mean, you know what? It's kind of like, um, kind of like how we used to be gatherers, gatherers and hunters. Right. This is our new way to gather and hunt. Right. As, as in the 21st century, it really is. And yeah, it's, you're right because it's, it's both the hunt of looking for the stuff and then gathering it when you find it. Absolutely. <laughs> this is modern day gathering of nuts and hunting for your food. It's right. Just a different, different way. Yeah, yeah nuts maybe. <laughs> I find lots of nuts. 
I gather tons of nuts. <laughs> I think I might be one of the nuts like you've the gathered meat. in oh. your travels. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Kevin, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Before we go, um, you know we now give $1,000 to charity of your choice. I understand you chose Queen of Hearts Animal Rescue. So That's we're going to make a $1,000 donation in your name. Can you tell us, I can guess, why you chose this uh, as your... Well, I can tell you exactly what it is. Um, we've had this lady working for us, Karina Delgado, ever since the boys were, were little, uh, 35 years. She is an eccentric, crazy woman who has the biggest heart in the world. And the thing, the one thing I would like to see is I'd like to see her and Colleen have a bake-off. Uh -huh. I'm going to bet on Karina. Even though I know Colleen's amazing, Karina is the most incredible baker I've ever met in my life. So um, one day we'll have to have a bake-off. Well, I but think I did woman, have some of her treats at Christmas a couple years ago. Yeah. This woman is so giving that on her week, any of her time off, she spends her time hunting cats, wild feral cats, to have them neutered and spayed wow. so they can be released back. She tries to have them adopted. Uh -huh. I have 12 of those things at my house. My, <laughs> I have a crazy cat woman wife. But however, <laughs> however, um, literally thousands this woman has done on her own. Wow. Captured, spayed, neutered, adopted or released. Wow. And uh, I mean, so basically I fund the whole thing and I'm happy to do so. And, uh, you know, she gets she gets a good price from her vets to do it. But, you know, it's still expensive to, you know, catch those animals. Right, to do then all you have to have them medically looked over then have the procedures done. But, um, yeah, this is this is a fabulous woman that, you know, the world doesn't know about. Her name is Karina. Well, and she great. runs Queen of Hearts. So well, if any of your viewers want to make a donation to Queen of Hearts, please join in. That's great. I would absolutely encourage people to do that. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's a great cause. And, and thank you for joining me, sharing these rarities. Like you said, these are coins that, the, you know, the other examples are in the Smithsonian. Yours are actually nicer. <laughs> you know, so I appreciate you bringing them that. and sharing them with, with me and with all of our viewers. And, I, you know, I always love getting a chance to spend time with you. It's always, it's always a lot of fun. So. Always great to be together, Jack. Be well. Have a wonderful day, and uh, I'm going to get to work. All right. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank eat, my apples. Eat, eat the rest of that. And All right. thank you, everyone else, for joining me today on Coin Snacks with Jack. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. We're streaming every week on Facebook and YouTube at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. So tune in for your weekly dose of numismatics, and we will see you next week for another episode featuring someone you all know and love, my partner here at Rare Collectibles TV, Rick Tamaska. See you there. Thanks for watching Coin Snacks with Jack. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe so you never miss an episode of Coin Snacks. Visit us at rarecollectibles.tv.com.